to the Dickinson County Historical Society and Museum. We're so pleased to be offered this to be offering this programming to the community. Um, this is the second in our series of History Lives. They'll be resuming again in January. So be looking at local media for what we'll have in store for you in January. Um, one other small plug. Next Thursday at 10 o'clock, we'll be doing the pastimes at the Arnold's Park Library. And we'll be talking about weird weather in the Lakes region. Uh, we'll be talking about tornadoes and blizzards and storms and who knows what else. The conversation is always great. And we'd love to have you come to those. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> I have a plant here to remind me to mention um, donations would be appreciated if, you, if uh, you'd like to donate to, to help us continue this series. Also, um, Gail will be standing here at the doorway with some <laughs> membership forms. If you're interested in becoming a member, just take a form and follow the directions. Um, members are good. <laughs> Memberships are good. So, it's time now to welcome Jonathan Reed. Jonathan is a local author and historian of note. He has written two books, Lost Resorts of the Iowa Great Lakes and Okaboji and the Iowa Great Lakes. We have both of these books for sale in the, in the office, and um, you may purchase them tonight if you'd like. Jonathan became interested in L.F. Williams through his research for these books. These are photo-driven books, and many, many, many of the photos he's used in his books are from L.F. Williams. Um, Jonathan is, one of, is on the board of directors of our Historical Society and Museum, a very active part of that board, and we appreciate it a lot, and we sure appreciate that Jonathan's willing to do this tonight. Um, I'm assuming at the end you're willing to take some questions. We'll try. Well, now that I've said that, you will. You will. <laughs> okay. Technology and the remote work. I've got uh, my buddy over there, and his name is Next. So <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be calling out to him quite a bit. You're right. As Mary said, um, in researching my two books uh, on the area, I started finding photographs either online or other places, and it struck me that these are really not just your usual snapshots. They are not just your usual. Uh, really tacky tourist photos, but they actually seem to be photos that had some some thought behind them, some design, uh, you know, making sure <coughs> it was all a clear image that was being being uh, put up. And eventually, I told them the idea that the man who was taking them was L. F. Williams. Next, and so and that is not a misspelling on his name. His name is Lucius Freeman Williams. Uh, it is spelled on his gravestone, L-O-U-C-L-U-S. So if it's carved in stone, I'm going to go with that. <laughs> so who was this guy? I mean, he was a portrait photographer. We're, oh, and by the way, we're going to spend just a little time on him and then mostly on the lakes area here. Portrait <coughs> photographer. He was a resort operator for a while, but not in the lakes area. Uh, he was a car guy. I'll talk about that in just a moment. A rusticator. How many people have heard the term rusticating before? Fisherman, aerial pioneer, owned an art gallery and photo studio, a businessman, and an unflagging area promoter. Now, Lucius Williams, as I said, was a car guy. Uh, you have to love the 21st century. I sent a picture of him in his car and asked, what is this? Well, it seems like it would be like a Model T, but what's all this stuff? Hey, guess what? They have the equivalent of J.C. Whitney or other car aftermarket things. You could buy a, a fancy radiator even for your Model T back then. So I was like, oh. So he was a car guy, very much into his automobiles. Next. So we're talking about him, talking about him today because his work in the area made an impact. 
But who he was is actually kind of a mystery. First of all, we've got the various misspellings or spellings of his name, either Williams with a Z or Lucius, L-U-C. That's the way it shows up in some of the uh, uh, legal documents. Uh, we do know, and I was able to verify, he was born in 1871 in Fremont County, down in the southern western corner of the state. His father, Delano Williams, was a Civil War veteran, wounded Civil War veteran. Uh, his mother died when he was five, and then, as far as I can tell, he was an only child and traveled along with dad wherever his father found work or a happy home or whatever could have happened. Um, growing into adulthood, he, he married uh, Bertha Morton of Moville. Obviously, he stayed within the Iowa and Nebraska area here, I and mean, moving out to North Platte, that was quite a way, so he kept coming back. <clears throat> Lost to history, how he and Bertha got together. We don't know. I've never found any uh, diaries or anything about that. And uh, he moved to Spirit Lake about 1896, uh, setting up a photo studio in case you're wondering where it was. It was the first store north of Marcus Snyder's implement building, <laughs> which, again, is kind of lost to history. We're not exactly sure where it is, uh, where that was. We're thinking it would be in the vicinity of the, um, uh, the family diner down here, which implements usually got over to mechanic shops, got over to gas stations, and there were gas stations all around those corners for many years. Next. So, he got married in 1898, quote, I have returned, good for him, set up his photo studio. He was still being, calling himself the Spirit Lake photographer at that time, had a Pretty fair business, I'm guessing, doing uh, family portraits, individual portraits, and uh, the problem with that is, and every other photographer was doing the same thing as well. You know, you want to keep your core business, but then move on to other things if you're a photographer. Um, no doubt, he started looking around, realizing this tourist area, he knew about it, obviously, he came up here in 1896, uh, in 1897, by that time, our Grand Hotel was on its way out, the Hotel Orleans, and uh, well, you know, I'm sure it caused a little bit of concern for somebody like him. Well, is, is the tourist area going to die? No, the railroads still are running, people are still coming into town, so life is looking good. So he ch changed his perception in the area to become the Yankee photographer. Again, just like his last name with the Z, he spelled it with an F. Cheaper by the letter to do it that way, maybe. I don't know. And uh, he did have a, a little launch, as you can see here. That's uh, Lucius and his wife Bertha there. Who wants to take a guess where that photo was taken? I'm guessing it was taken from the coal dock that used to extend out just to the side of the um, where you go between the East Lake, where the, where the grade is now. So, one thing that he figured out early on, again, was that you've got this tourist area here, and you can capture images that people either would not have seen or that they might have seen and want to relive, because that's the beauty of photography. Photography helps you remember it just the way it was, even though it might not be exactly true. This is maybe one of my favorite hard-to-find photographs, taken from a boat, uh, taking, taken of the Grand Hotel Orleans, probably just a year or two before it closed down. Mm. But you can see some of the seven spires, so, uh, some of the seven uh, peaks that they had there. You get a clue in this area of the 14-foot wide um, walkways they had, the verandas, because when it was built in the 1880s, people would like to be seen. So they'd step out of their room, and then they would meander around, and just like, uh, oh, let's see, as you might have seen on the deck of the Titanic in that movie, everyone is you know, very gracious to one another. But I love this photo, not only because it is from the water, there's so few of that, but you can see um, the bathhouse there, you can see the queen up on the shore, perhaps waiting for some buyer to come take her to some other place. It took about three years to sell the Queen after they uh, decided it was not going to sell. They had a boat rental shop here and fishing shops over here. 
That would be the um, water tower across the across the road from the from the uh, train station. Really love this photo. It's just a slice of what you might have seen. Next, and again, when I first saw this photo, I thought, oh, they're moving the Queen over to Westlake. Well, that really didn't happen until after those spires on the other side were gone, because the Hotel Orleans was torn down. Uh, about the time many of the, the, the deals, oh, and the Queen was almost sold about three times. People get close, you express interest, almost go under contract, and then finally a gentleman from Spencer uh, got control of it in 1900, 1901, winter, moved it over. Next. He also took photos of things that were happening. You can see this, unfortunately, has been uh, uh, damaged through time. But the Hotel Orleans, the second Hotel Orleans, burned in uh, 1909. Uh, that one, I believe, was caused by some people burning, uh, <laughs> burning waste paper, and they didn't know there was a hole in the chimney. There she went. Uh, fire is uh, probably the way most of the uh, larger buildings around here have been destroyed. So he also took more pictures of the commonplace, the things that people would have seen. This is the Spirit Lake Swim Bridge. It is? Yeah. You're looking at the foot of Lake Street down there. Yeah. And across the, here's my fingertip here, you know, across there was D.S. Blakey's farm. He also put in a little uh, nice 1890s, 1900s era convenience store for the boaters to come in. You could buy candy, cigars, cigarettes, snacks, and so forth. I love this photo because it's a snapshot of daily life. Fishermen out there on the dock, and you've got uh, the bridge that's closed. Over here on this side, uh, Frank Hopkins had a steamboat, and uh, one, th this was his steamboat landing. And in case you ever wondered, why does Lake Street in Spirit Lake seem to have so much prominence? Uh, this is why, because you, with Lake Street, with, with no stops to speak of, you could go all the way from the boat landings down here, the steamboat landings, all the way up to the train station. Two of the most important means to, uh, to get around in here. Oh, and that is uh, Williams's, we think, 1905 Waltham motor car, which you steered with a tiller, not a steering wheel. Really amazing. Yeah, just closing in on this here. Uh, there were a number of people that uh, actually I guess I would say fought, but argued in front of city council to have the lucrative um, boat rental business there, the livery business there. And it changed hands numerous years. With the close-up here, you can see bathing. You could probably rent a swimsuit from Lakey Store. Uh, I've seen other photos of people swimming in the water right there. How, how things have changed through the years. <laughs> oh, no, if I can hit by a motorboat now. <laughs> And of course, the, uh, uh, the swing bridge, which would swing out of the way to allow the steamships to go back and forth. And the steamships used to go all the way uh, to the north end and dock uh, uh, up at the Hotel Orleans. They had a, a dock on the other side, not to mention our, um, you know, our other parks and, and other venues. Frank Hopkins, here he is with his office. And you get a really good shot of the uh, uh, the 19, 1905 Waltham automobile. It took a little bit of courage to drive something like that more than just five or ten miles an hour. I've seen videos, and uh, you, don't, you don't want to do that now. Next. But Okaboji had its own swing bridge. It was probably more heavily used, if anything, simply because Okaboji and what they called the grade was there. Uh, you can see that the, the boat has been, or the, the bridge has been turned. Uh, only, uh, it was only done when steamboats were coming through, and if you can see the other side, this is not a wide angle, but the, uh, the trestle bridge would have been turned as well. There were certain times of the day they knew when uh, uh, the bridge turner who had contracts to do this, they had to be there. And in case you're wondering how they did it, if you look really close, you'll see there's a little T right here. It was all hand cranked. If you're a really smart bridge operator, you can get the kids to do the work for you. <laughs> because you put kids on it, you put on it, and you walk around and walk around, and literally a large gear would turn the bridge. Uh, I think if you were to pay attention while you were boating through into East Lake from West Lake, and you look 
on the trestle bridge, you can still see that main post. Whether the gear is there, I don't know. But that's the way they used to do it. Other areas that he liked to photograph. Things that people would have seen. Things that people would have remarked upon. Well, that's just an ugly old bridge. Where is that? Well, that was the Buffalo Run Bridge. Yeah. That was a thing of beauty in its day. Yeah. People would take the, uh, take the ride out in either by carriage or in their motor cars, if they had them, to just go see the bridge or stand on top of it. You know, and, and enjoy the view. Um, you can see it was really rustic, and the roads were nothing special at all. At, even at that time, 1905, 1910, you were just looking at dirt roads, not even gravel. But, you know, anything that gave you a little bit of height so that you could see a little farther uh, across the lake, people seemed to enjoy that, and as, as this family is here. But being now a tourist photographer, in addition to a portrait photographer, Williams surely knew uh, how best to capture um, the right images that people would want to buy, that they'd want to take home, put in their own cabinets with their own photo photographs and so forth, such as this uh, wide-angle view of uh, Arnold's Park in 1908. Uh, which takes me to another little sidebar here. One thing I loved about many of Williams's published photographs, especially, especially I believe the ones he had for sale, he would date them so that you knew, oh yes, you know that building was there in 1908. Damn, now I've got, you know, I know when it was there, and I can go and check the newspapers and look other places as well. So thank you, Mr. Williams or Mrs. Williams, whoever uh, thought to do that. But it's really fun to see what we're looking at here. The, these motor launches, you've got steamboats off to the side, probably the motor bojo over in, on the uh, far left side as well there. The uh, pavilion, the Arnold's Park Pavilion, had not yet been moved back. Oh wait, the pavilion? The pavilion was the dance hall that was put up in the late, 18, late 1890s. Uh, it was a dance hall, it was a meeting hall, they had all kinds of things. If you remember, a few of us have some gray hair here. If you remember being able to drive around in front, drive your car in front and scoop the loop in front of the, uh, 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 the roof garden, and then of course the uh, um, uh, hello, Fun what's house. the building I'm thinking of here with the slide in it? Funhouse. Fun Funhouse, yes. thank you. Um, the, that was in fact, the Funhouse was in fact the pavilion, but Dr. Peck moved it back some 30 feet, just so, well, you could say so the people could drive by. No, it was actually so that he could try to charge more admission for you to get to the lake. But that's another story. Next. Now, I said he was a rusticator. Love this photograph. This is from the Williams photo albums. You can see they've glued another photograph on there as well. But this is a, a portrait, their portrait that he took of a little shack with his very close friends, Clarence Hill, and, and his family. And what we're seeing here is really the height of rusticating. What, I mean, these people had comfortable houses in town. Well, they like to get out and kind of become closer with nature, closer with the way it was maybe in their youth or in their parents' youth. Uh, obviously, that's an unheated, very airy looking <laughs> structure. Um, who knows what they, maybe people slept in there, we don't know. But I love this photo for a variety of reasons. You know, the trees here that are just hanging out, somebody's valise there, they chopped down a tree there. Um, you've got uh, Bertha Williams here, Clarence Hill, and his wife Laura, and their little son Herschel. And uh, let's go to the next photo. You can zoom in, I don't know what Herschel's eating there, but obviously they're having lunch or some sort of, some sort of meal. Outside, I mean, they're really enjoying the rustic life, and that's uh, that was a thing back in the day. Herschel Hill, maybe you've seen this photo at the uh, Maritime Museum. You know, Herschel Hill with his little stringer of fish there. Uh, he grew up to be following, to, in part, in his father's footsteps, running a hardware store. Uh, Clarence Hill, among other things, became the the operator of uh, Hill and Spurback Hardware. And uh, Herschel ran the store for a while and eventually became one of the owners of the Queen. Next. It was
was a lovely family, as you can tell. And uh, perhaps, we don't know, but perhaps, that, perhaps that's a Williams photograph. But that, this is a, a Lucius Williams on the left, that's <coughs> on the hill, his wife uh, Bertha May. Uh, the baby is um, baby Everett. Um, again, they were unique individuals. Williams with a Z, Bertha, fairly common spelling on, on that. But uh, Williams' children were uh, Everd, E-V-A-R-D, Thora, and Theta. <laughs> okay, they, I mean, they were determined to make their children stand out somewhere. And then Herschel Hill made about age four or five, and then Clarence Hill, C.P. Hill on the right. Next. So what else would people have seen in the day? Now, uh, we already, if you go to our Facebook page, you would have seen we've already shown this picture and indicated what it is and where it is, but it's hard to imagine today. Uh, and that, that's why we're doing this now, because a lot of it is imagine if you can today, that this was built out over Pikes Point. This was the, uh, the first clubhouse of the Okoboji Yacht Club. And it was actually uh, came from several dozen I'll just say rods because I don't know how long that is. A distance away to the to the south, it was uh, part of a um, a little enclave that was built there by D.C. Patterson. <coughs> it had a huge mansion that was sold to, to remind people of the U.S. Treasury Building. Well, it was big. It had pillars. It had an interior uh, porch over it, second-story porch. But this was uh, part of their the Patterson's little resort, and it was a dining hall. So. They, the Pattersons, lost interest, started selling off pieces of property and so forth, and uh, the people that formed had formed the, um, uh, the Yacht Club, uh, no doubt bought it, or leased it, or in some way caused it to be moved down. They built that lovely second story porch on it, and that was uh, pretty much the starting point for many of the, uh, the high-speed boat races that began, uh, that were under the auspices of the, the Okoboji Yacht Club. High speed, meaning 20 miles an hour, perhaps. So, but the, that was put up uh, just around the turn of the century, and as far as I can tell, it was gone by about uh, 1911, 1912. Oh, yeah. I remember going up and looking at the Patterson House. Yes. We called it, we called it the Haunted House. Yes. And it, it had been left, it, it just people had just gone away, and it had all kinds of uh, books and stuff that were left in there, but that was just to the right of that. Yes, exactly. Thanks, Billy. Personal recollection. Can't beat it. Next. But, I mean, let's be honest. Most people who came to the Lakes area, especially uh, up until about after World War I, um, until just after World War I, they came by train. And whether you're talking about um, Wesley Arnold, who put the, the first amusement park uh, ideas go, and got them going, or his uh, son-in-law, Dr. Peck, when you're arriving by train, what's the first thing you see from the south? You're going to see the amusement park, or at least whatever it was. I'm sure after you've been on a train for three, four, or five hours, <laughs> You know, the biggest town you've seen other than Spencer was Milford. So you get up here, it's like, let me out of here. I'm ready to get off the train now. And this would be, you know, one of the first views you would have seen after getting off the train, going down, uh, down to the lake, past, uh, past the, the Arnold's Park Hotel. And, I mean, you can catch this same view right now. It has not changed. Uh, you can still see the sand beach. Well, what, there's no more Okoboji steamship. Uh, and Pillsbury Point has gotten overgrown, but that's going to be changing in a few years, I understand. So we'll have to, uh, have to see what the future holds. But I love this photo. I mean, it's just a snapshot of life in 1910 at the beach. Gentlemen there with their hats on, women wearing their long skirts uh, made of cotton or wool, uh, a sail, a sail, a rowboat that somebody has rented, and then kids out on a little, uh, a little diving platform. And, and those things came and went every year. And sometimes they were taller, sometimes they were smaller. Um, but no doubt, you can find a 12-year-old willing to try to hurt themselves on it. <laughs> yeah. 
And a few years later, 1960, and look at the crowd. You know, by this time, it looks like they've added a slide and a few other uh, playtime type things for the kids. But this was, uh, you know, to me, this looks like a warm Sunday afternoon at Arnold's Park at the beach. You can't beat it. And really, has it changed any in 100 years? Not, not a whole lot. Again, another copyrighted photo, 1909, uh, the Okaboja sailing away from the Inn Hotel. Uh, yeah, pollution. Yeah, the good old days, that was where I was going to go. Yeah, everybody thinks the good old days were all so clean and pure and pristine. And not necessarily when the steam engine uh, inside the, the steamships, of which there were many, started belching, belching uh, soot. Let's go to the next one, which is a good point. You can see here the Okaboji, the Golden Rule uh, sailboat. Yes, there was a, uh, a passenger sailboat that you could get a ride on. Um, it was actually the Golden Rule, Rule sailboat was, was built by John Hafer and uh, it was sailed by, uh, let me think of his name, H.C. Cars was his nickname. Uh, oh, H.C. Mills, otherwise known as Cars Mills, who operated it uh, from the 1890s up until about, uh, well, this may have been near one of the last years on this. Uh, it was finally converted to uh, power. They put a, a gasoline engine in it, and then it's it lost the history. We don't know exactly what became of it. But I will point out, you can see that the Okaboja has uh, a cover over the second story here. That's the queen up on the top sailing away. There was no cover at that time. There was, there was no roof on top, which meant that if you went out for a Sunday afternoon cruise, you could be assured of having to come back, you know, cleaning yourself with cinders. <coughs> uh, that was put on about 1910, as far as we know. So you're a fisherman. You want to come to Okaboji, where do you want to go? You want to go where the big fish are. <laughs> Whether this was staged or he just happened to catch it, I don't know. It's a lovely photograph. It took a little bit of research, a little bit of detective work to figure out where it was. Well, um, at that time, Miller's Bay was probably more attractive than many other bays at the time, simply because it was still fairly rustic. It was not heavily built up around that time. And let's call this about 1910 as well. So what you're looking at here is he took half a dozen different photograph, photographs of the point and everything around Miller's Bay. This is, um, uh, tell me, say it again, Hiawatha Point. Yes. I get my Indian names mixed up when you start going around the lake. I have to start one place and then work all the way around. Yeah, so this would have been Hiawatha Point right on the uh, first south end of, uh, of Miller's Bay. But it's a, it, it, it's a great photograph and no doubt he sold a lot of postcards with this. I mentioned he was a car guy. In 1911, uh, he had uh, purchased a new brush automobile in Esterville. Went over there, rode up by train to pick it up, and uh, wanted to show it off, I'm sure. So, this photograph I love, not just because you've got a little six or seven year old Everett behind the wheel, along with Bertha and Cora there, but also you need to look at where it is. This is taken as you come out of the, underpa the underpass at the Inn Hotel. There was at that time, the main road that went along the lake went in front of the Inn Hotel, and then you would turn and go up that way to hit some of the other buildings back there. All gone, just a memory now, along with brush automobiles. They, they did not survive the depressions. Ah, one of uh, William's stock in trade, I guess you'd call it, was that he bought a panoramic, panoramic camera. Uh, I don't know how many people know photography, but this was a really cool device. I want one <laughs> because it was a camera that the lens and the film would turn simultaneously when you took a picture so that you ended up with not the distortion that you get now when we use our phones to do the, you know, the, the panoramic with that. 
So you end up with this lovely straight looking image uh, on the film. And this is, again, the slice of life. But it really comes alive when you start zooming into some of these things. That would be next. Over in the extreme left side, you can see the central, uh, central dance hall down there, which became the Central Emporium. And this, after uh, the, uh, the, the hotel burned, the Milwaukee Hotel, depending on who you want to talk to, when that burned in 1911, it would only be around a few years, uh, an ice cream stand was built right in front of it. Got to get the people there. Cool thing about this was that even though you had a walkway here, that there was, you went and walked out over uh, on a, uh, a trestle of sorts, on a bridge of sorts, to get into the central ballroom to dance. Really cool. So, let's go a little farther. Mm -hmm. uh, Fish Market, it's Charlie Tennant's dry cleaning, had a drop-off stand there, and then a center, real estate center, it said Gateswood. But uh, you know where that is? Mm -hmm. If I say Bombazi, that's where it is. That's where that is taken. Now, that's where the Bombazi uh, hair salon is. So we're looking up the, up oh, the hill. Sure. Yeah. Sure, sure. And then the Lake Hotel. This is uh, right where Captain's Getaway is now, at least their entertainment complex of it. If you were to look at the gentleman standing right behind him as a grassy space, that became, uh, in the 1920s, the, uh, a bank. <coughs> it was incorporated at that time. Mm -hmm. And so, to help you orient yourself, that grassy space is where the entrance to Captain's Getaway is. So, but the Lake Hotel, that was actually the Arnold's Park School. They lifted it up off of where the middle school building is now, moved it up here, and <coughs> it was one of the more prominent, um, I guess I'd say itinerant hotels, meaning you could probably get off the train uh, with just a day, uh, a day's clothes, change of clothes in your pocket even, and oh gosh, you know, I stayed too late, where am I going to spend the night? Boom, right there. Because the, uh, the guest hotel, or excuse me, the, the tourist hotel, uh, the Arnold's Park Hotel would have likely been booked. Mm -hmm. So this would have been for you know, salesmen, for people who just stayed too late and, gosh, uh, need a place to sleep. Um, it did not make it beyond the 30s, succumb to fire. Mm -hmm. So, times changed. We've uh, been taking a lot of uh, photos here, seeing a lot of photos of Williams, and uh, through 1910, we had one little jump to 1919. But he was taking photos and he saw an airplane. It was, wow, really terrifying looking. I've seen a similar type photo uh, that they had at the, at the uh, county fair here. It was literally wood, canvas, and bailing wire. Uh, it took an awful lot of courage. But it moved pretty fast, probably 40 miles an hour, 45. You know, we've got a fast horse going at full speed. So William saw this, bought himself a new, uh, new camera. And, okay. so, yeah, so here we are, didn't take too long, a decade, until he finally either had the courage or convinced um, some of his friends, they became friends, the Donaldson brothers, mm -hmm. to uh, take him up in an airplane. Depending on who you talk to and what accounts you have, they were either, you know, the Donaldsons were daring adventurers, gifted mechanics or just complete hell racers. <laughs> Maybe all of the, of the above. They were a fairly prolific family. But this was, as far as we know, the first documented news story about Williams going up into an airplane, which gives us now a whole new way to look at the lakes area. A Curtis Model F. They'd actually been making these things before <coughs> World War I, with only a few refinements over the years. Uh, we don't know, although I, I found out that the Donaldsons and uh, some of the barnstorming crew did have Curtises. We don't know when they acquired this one or how old it was, but it literally was a flying boat. And you would sit in the pon single pontoon of the boat, and that 500 pound motor above your head would be cranking away, belching all kinds of noxious gases. Mm -hmm. And if you had the courage to do it, I'm sure you loved it. Okay. 
that didn't go. Mm -hmm. So you could have taken a seaplane ride around the lakes. Uh, for the early 1920s, uh, a few operators uh, <coughs> brought the seaplanes in and would give you rides. Uh, I think I read once a dollar a pound, or 50, 10 cents a pound, and it was 10 cents a pound. You know, and they would take you up, go around, and, uh, and land you back in. If you happen to see the video that I explained to, um, to Jeff Thie, uh, I found some, you know, hand crank film of uh, one of these seaplanes taking off against the wind, and it must have been terrifying, but <laughs> exhilarating if you survived. <laughs> But regardless, here we are, you know, an example of some of the aerial photography. You can see the seaplane, you can see the long docks, you can see over here the, um, the water toboggan, the shoot the shoots as they called it. Uh, at this point, okay, the way here, you can see that by 1920 the pavilion had, had been moved back, but there still was the Lakeside Department Store in its place. Um, it, we were, at that time, we meaning our own spark, we were a complete destination. You could buy groceries, get a haircut, buy clothing. You could rent a swimsuit. You could uh, lease a boat. You could even take an airplane ride. Why would you not come to our own park? Flew around this first year. Look at this beautiful Templar Park. It had been up for about a year. Look at what's different now. First of all, the building is there. It's not there now. Um, the, 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 the Templars, if nothing else, were not industri were industrious. Uh, looking through aerial photographs at the time, sometimes they had uh, parade grounds, sometimes they dug lagoons, sometimes, sometimes they put in shuffleboard. I mean, whatever their guests wanted, they seemed to, to do it. So it was always kind of in a state of flux. But I look at this photo and it never occurred to me to, to learn it's actually kind of on a little point. Never noticed that until now. Uh, and it's just outside, but the archway entrance is still there, and then the only other thing is the cement staircases. Sometimes the mundane can take on a whole new meaning. Look at this. What am I looking at here? This was Arnold's Park. The amusement park is off on, <coughs> on this side somewhere. You can see the monument. All by its own, that many trees around it. Isn't that just amazing? And I also love this because it's one of the few pictures that I've ever seen of the Lincoln Park Hotel roof line down there. Still keeping with the same view. Someone asked me, um, did we really have a baseball team here? Well, every town kind of had its own baseball teams. And yeah, baseball was the major, uh, major attraction. And you can see we have a ball field right there. You can see it's all worn out. The train used to come along here. And if you didn't want to buy tickets, this was raised up about 10 feet. You could look over the first baseline <laughs> and be able to see it watch them play ball. This is now the amusement park parking lot. And screwing a little bit, you can see a steamship up at the top there. Uh, also, before the days of the state pier. He definitely flew around. Not the best photo because it was a little jiggly, but it gives you some idea of what was happening up uh, in Spirit Lake uh, at Orleans. Um, my heavens, the spillway, there was no spillway at that time. It just flowed through. You know, there, there was no little dam there. You can see the dance hall. You can see the uh, third, I think, iteration of um, the Hotel Orleans. Um, Nelson's boat livery was over here, Frank Marnett's was over there on the far side. And probably one recognizable thing, if you see it, that actually was the bridge over. This is where the road goes. <laughs> Crazy, don't think back. And, um, and also look at the depth of the beach. This was probably a fairly normal water, um, water height on it, if not just a, a tad high. A new structure. The 1917 West Okoboji Golf Course, Golf and Country Club. What? There was a golf course on West Oak? Yeah, there was. Over, in, uh, over behind, um, behind the canals. And it's all literally grown up now. It was finally abandoned uh, after World War II. This was the first of the clubhouses 
uh, it burned, they built another one, and it's gone as well. And now I have not been able to actually trip over any foundation stones, but I'm sure they're out there somewhere in between the lake and Highway 86. So, time merges on, as we can see. Here we have, um, similar to the first view, Stephen's Beach. Um, Peck's, Peck's had one side, Stevens had the other, but by this time, 1920-ish, uh, Bennett had built the uh, I built the roller rink. Uh, I'm guessing that's one of the reasons for taking this photo, simply because it, uh, you, it gave you not just the roller rink on one side, but it also gave you the roller coaster on the other. The Lakeside Department Store was still going, but Mr. Next, in 1924, we can see what happened. They built on top of the Lakeside Department Store the Roof Garden Ballroom. Actually, it was kind of genius. It was built, as we can all guess, on the cheap, a lot of 4 by 4s a lot of 2x4s, literally just right above, um, uh, above the street. Got those out of there, and dancing became the vernacular of the day. That's how people met. That's how people courted. Uh, it was the, the Facebook and whatever all the other things are of the day. We kind of missed that. And a view that most people don't see because you're in your car. Look at this, the view between the East and West Lakes. I love that view. Smitty, have you ever learned definitively what that building was there? No, I have not either. I've seen a number of signs on it. Uh, you could buy, uh, uh, somebody was selling some chocolate there, uh, you know, so-and-so chocolate. Uh, I do know that the early version of the DNR used it for a while. Um, Mary Kennedy thinks it might have been <coughs> some kind of coal, not a coal dock, but a place Space, where all the space from where that is yeah, to the right, right, all was dumped with uh, boats that were sunk and so on over the years. Exactly right. And, you know, depending on which sketch you see, I mean, you can say, oh, you know, the, the Iona was there, or the Iowa was buried there, or this sailboat was buried there. Sometimes they'd you know, set fire to him, let him burn down to the waterline and sink. Other times that would happen on their own already. Most boats, as uh, uh, historian Aubrey Lafoy will tell you, the wooden hull boats were only good for about 20 years. And then after that, you know, it just is not worth trying to keep them afloat. The Queen, because it was a steel hull, lasted all the way until it got shipped away in the 1970s. So, yeah, but I love this photograph because everything from that building on back is now a parking lot and has yep. been beautified. Which is more in line with the way we live today. Uh, you know, no need for a coal dock, which was right here. And by this time, it eh, looks like the modern bridge might have even been, uh, been in, put in by that time, meaning non-turning. Thanks. Manhattan, there are so many photographs that uh, Williams took of Manhattan simply because I think it captured his, his imagination. But it changed over time. So many years, uh, different owners would come in and have a different vision of how to, how to uh, make money with this kind of a white elephant on the far side of the lake. But by this time, call it 1920, uh, the roads were improving. Um, people could get there through you know, by their launches or by an automobile. Uh, when they, they actually had uh, built out over the sandbar here, mm -hmm. you know, they like to say that every room had a had a lake um, lake breeze coming through it. Uh, the family the was Meyer Lake. Yeah, yeah, lots of Meyer Lake. Lots, lots of different owners. One of the last ones was uh, was Meyer Lake. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So Manhattan was, uh, he also had many photographs of the inn. Um, I've seen photographs from him of the Crescent Beach Hotel and all of that. In the interest of not talking for another two hours, <laughs> they're not up here tonight. <laughs> so, again, time marches on. Here we can see, remember the <clears throat> picture I showed you of the Central Dance Hall Central Ballroom? This is what it looked like in 1929. 
candy shop, ice cream shop is gone. That's what this big, big area is here. This is the way it is uh, right now. It's been extended out to be a huge, um, huge dance hall area. You've got here our train station, uptown, Arnold's Park there, and then the very popular S turn. We took you down so that you could scoop the loop and drive down into the park. So what became of Williams? Sadly, he was killed. Car guy died in an auto accident. Uh, I will not repeat what they said, but it was gruesome and grisly. Um, nevertheless, you can find postcards such as that last one with a copyright after his death. The Arnold's Park one with the Central was copyrighted in 1929. That's because Bertha carried on. She was a photographer in her own right, did not change the business name at all, but still was William's photo. Uh, I suspect she may have even been one of the people that climbed into an airplane to try it again. You know, by uh, the 30s, uh, airplanes were a little, a little safer and you could uh, feel somewhat secure. She carried on the business until 1938, through the Depression and kept it going, and they eventually sold it to a uh, neighbor photo. Well, it uh, seemed to have uh, many of the same tourist type things through the 40s as well. So, a little note here, this was my, my thank you to the Historical okay. Museum. We actually have the family albums uh, that Everett had saved and collected, and they were donated to, to the museum, I think it was 1978, in that era. Mm -hmm. Not long before he died, but uh, we we all kind of owe a, a thanks to uh, yeah. next. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, all thanks to uh, L.F. Williams for having the presence of mind to try to chase a dollar and actually give us something that we can enjoy a hundred years later, if not more. Think about it. You look at all these cabinet cards and photos that people had taken in from the 1880s up until the end of date. Um, as time moves on and families I saw that. move on and stop recording, I guess this was Grandpa Jones's photo taken in 1907, it just becomes something that nobody knows, which is sad, which is why I really appreciate Williams taking photos of the area taking photos of people doing things in the area and people enjoying next and people enjoying thank you. you know all because of Ella Williams photo. So that's all I've got to say. I'll make it under an hour. You're doing good. <laughs> Where was that stone bridge that was out there? Uh, that was on the west side of Big Spirit. If you drive up there now, you'll see a sign that says Buffalo Run, okay. and that was over at Buffalo Run. Yeah. Oh. But we just saw that picture of the Queen. If you today go to where the inn was, yes. you will see that that tree, that tree is still, is still there. Yeah. It's the only one that still is yeah. there. Yeah, I mean, it was also kind of fun. Uh, there were a couple of trees they used to photograph one was called the Spooner's Tree because it went up and then it had a lot of large, sturdy, horizontal branches. And you know, you could kind of get with your, they had a ladder going up, kind of get with your sweetie and, you know, be together but be apart, sort of, so nobody noticed. You know, that was one of the, one of the, uh, the many attractions of the, of the inn at that time. Um, the writing in white, is that that he just wrote on the uh, negative or? That's a good question. I've never seen any negatives. You could have done it either way. Um, a lot of times, if you were really talented, you scratch the emulsion off right. the back, okay. which definitely permanent if you're doing that. Um, I suspect Bertha may have had the artistic talent in that way because I've seen some photos where they do identify the name or the date or something like that. And then she would draw something around it with scroll work, looking like it's a you know a document of some sort, and, and I mean it really is above and beyond what anybody would would need. But to answer your question, no, I don't know whether it was there. There is retouching ink that you can put on negatives as well. That's uh, scratching would make it black, wouldn't it? Um, 
Let the light go through. Yeah, yes. you're probably right. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, so disregard that. <laughs> well, we, we have a One of the things I think you should point out to him, he didn't just walk up and shoot pictures. He scouted those locations. He made sure that people were there yes. at certain times. He, he, he may have been out at 6 or 7 in the morning to take those fishermen or oh, something like that. Because he had to go where the sun was. He had to do all of that so he didn't get a lot of reflection and a lot of hard, mm -hmm. hard well, stuff. Photography was different in those days, Definitely. too. We didn't have the high-speed films. Um, I can tell you that, that um, one of the earliest ads that he put in to the newspaper talking about he's now open for business, he has all the latest backgrounds and everything, and then he proceeds to spend a paragraph talking about the best time to come to a studio, because on sunny right. days you can come and do this and that, on cloudy days is good for this type of portraiture, mm -hmm. and so forth. You have to make do with what you've got. But he was interested in trying to take good photos. That's true. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Well, I hope as you go around and see some of the photos that we have here, and also look at my uh, museum page or uh, my Facebook page, Okaboji in there, Great Lakes History Books by Jonathan Reed. <laughs> I want the description rather than something cute.